Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and this is Crusader Kings 3 The Royal Court. I don't have that much experience in CK3. When it first came out, I played as Ireland, went from single county count to a king of a united Ireland. A few days ago, I played several hours as Vikings to reacquaint myself. Because while I am going to be learning this game as I play it on this playthrough, I don't want to be stumbling blind completely for the first four episodes on completely basic stuff. I've also messed around in Ruler Builder a bit, and I'm going to show that off in my first playthrough. First, let's go over to 867 and talk about what we're doing, and why we're playing on 867. The big reason I like the 867 map so much more is the tremendous number of independent people just all over the map. There's a lot of different ways the map can play out as a consequence. I feel like with the locked-in Kingdoms of England and Ireland and Scotland, it all feels much more set in stone, and there's a lot less variance in how the world plays out. Next, I'll be playing a Norse Viking, and the reason I'm doing that it's because I played the most of that kind of character in CK2, so I'll have a better appreciation for what's changed going into CK3 if I play one of them here. Now, if I were to pick somebody like Bjorn Ironside, I would have tons of history. But since I want to start as a single county count, the single county counts over here don't really have any history. This is the guy I picked previously, Chieftain Eriker here. He has no mom, no dad, no wife, one kid. Like, they're just randomly generated, they have no history, and if that's the case, I may as well make my own history. So let's go check out Roar Builder and talk about what I'm doing. My character's name of Gene Seed might give you a clue as to how I'm building him, because I view Roar Builder as a very gamey, silly system, and I have a very gamey, silly thing that I think I'll enjoy doing. First, though, we need to work on this dynasty. We're going with the family name of Mikligard, essentially of Byzantium, and the motto, better to fight and fall than to live without hope. Yes, I did just pull that from a Google search for Viking house mottos, however, it also is a great description of how I tend to play Crusader Kings, and really strategy games as a whole. I couldn't tell you why I like this design so much, like black, white, and purple for a Byzantium-associated faction, that feels appropriate for me. And the runic circle I sort of get, but the big white hand is Saruman, I don't know why it feels good to me. I like the way it looks aesthetically, I'm not going to think too hard about it, we're going with this crest. And we need to change our appearance now, because we're very shortly going to lose track of this guy's face. Okay, so this is the character we're going with. I randomized into something pretty close to this, made him taller with darker hair and paler skin. Something that's felt more like a Viking in my mind. And the way we're going to be doing this is we want some very specific traits. We want specifically the big three genetic traits, Handsome, Genius, and Herculean. We need one at the max level, the other two we just need to have at some level. I've done this already, I've mapped it out, we're getting Handsome and Hail. We also want Pure Blooded, because that's a very hard trait to get, it seems like it's an entire campaign worth of genetics. And Fecan, because we need to have a lot of kids and we're trying to make Pure Blooded stick around. These are the five traits that we're trying to get. As you can see, we're already 213 points above our target. We're probably going to end up having to be around 40 if I remember this correctly. And now we're going to take literally every bad trait that you can to pay off this. Because you don't just need to do this, we also need to start with sons to inherit these traits. So we're going to be lazy, craven, shy, and let's not forget paranoid. But there's a lot more negative traits over here and other traits. We're also going to be a drunkard, reclusive, a flagellant, a profligate, wait, nope, that one's actually good, improvident, contrite, and a comfort eater. We can't be melancholic or any of this other stuff, because unfortunately these all do get passed on to your kids. But we can not take pneumonia so that we die immediately, because trust me, we're not making the sort of character you want to play as for long. We're going to be a one-legged leper who's disfigured and infirm and gout-ridden, suffering from consumption, has cancer and typhus. Cancer's not genetic or anything, right? Yeah. And of course we need to be blind, why not? Smallpox doesn't go to our kids, so let's just make sure we die real quick. And there's a few more negative traits way down at the bottom. We can be a deviant, adulterer, fornicator, murderer, and disloyal to boot. So like this, we can get two sons, but with three more years, we can get three sons. And something I forgot to do is I didn't reduce all of my skills to zero. This gets us a lot more points, because why would we waste our skills here when we could instead have more sons? A lot more sons. Nine sons feels like there's a very good odd of keeping our genetics alive. I could, instead of taking Hail, give up some sons and make that a better trait. Going to Beautiful would cost me four of my sons, but would also probably increase our fertility in the long run. And going up to Herculean, or sorry, to Robust, 
would cost me six of my sun, so that's definitely not happening. I think I am going to take a Genius and Beautiful, stay at Hale here, take Pure Blooded and Fecans, and give up four of my sons. So now we have slightly better genetics, but less people spreading them. And I'm very happy with this character. Gene Seed of Mikligard looks like a great guy. How could you not love him? It's interesting that I can see his eyes, considering that he's blind, but that's not important. Let's get into the game and see what our children rolled up as, because it's entirely random what they got. But recessive genes do exist in this game, so even if they get nothing, over the course of their lives, they'll probably have kids who get something. The heir is the one who matters the most. He's intelligent and hale. It could be worse. His older brother is genius and fecund. He's just objectively better. Just intelligent there. Fecund and handsome. And nothing. But hopefully they'll end up doing some stuff in their own lives, having kids, recessive genes come through, and we can pass on more than just those genes. Now, pretty much as soon as I start the timer, my character is going to drop dead. So I need to spend my prestige now while I have it. I also have a very important decision that I need to make. I need to strengthen the bloodline. Because we have all three types of genetic traits, I can take this decision point. And in doing this gives the dynasty the trait strong blood, which gives them a 40% increased chance of inheriting good traits and a 400% chance of getting new ones, which is fantastic. It also comes with a small health boost. So yeah, absolutely. The strength of Afmiklagard for generations, all of one. Our dynasty has been known for the strength of its blood. Vigor, beauty, and intellect are all attributes associated with this man. My old excellence confirms this. I think pride is one of the few negative traits that I don't have. But yeah, we have a tremendously better bloodline because of that. And now my name is Gene Seed the Bloodfather, which I find wonderfully appropriate. Time to die. There's a little bit before dying, actually. Let's get this right. I can just kill myself. That's that's a good way to die faster, I guess. But before I do, I should come over to military. We started with 100 of these guys. That's pretty rough. We're going to create a men-at-arms regiment. They're going to be the Varangian veterans. Absolutely. I can't afford to make a second one, but I can do something with this. I can go armored footmen. I can just increase the size of these guys. That's probably better. I can actually do it twice. So that's all of my prestige. Got two units of this, one unit of ranking and veterans. What is my current situation? I'm not declaring wars. I do want to get them married. I do want to put out the call for a court physician. I'll just do that on my next character, actually. I know I need more champions. I'm not getting endorsed. That's fine. I know I'm dying. I'm not getting married. Um, I know he's unmarried. I know I don't have a lifestyle. I'm not getting one. It's more of a death style, and I don't care about the encyclopedia. So, we need to get these people married, and the most important marriage is this guy, because he's got the best traits. So, let's find a marriage for him. Everyone hates me on account of my terrible personality, but they'll still say yes. That's good. There is a singular beautiful person that can get married. We're going to marry them all up to my genius fecund son, if it will be accepted. And they will accept it just barely. So that's going to happen for him. Going over to my heir, need to arrange a marriage for them. Or find a spouse, rather. Ragnhilder is unfortunately a little bit too old, despite her robust trait. What we're going to be looking for in his wife is just the highest amount of stewardship we can find. If I were to click on you, what is your... I would like to find somebody who's Midas touched, but it's looking like that's literally not even an option. So in that case, we'll just be going with the person with the highest stewardship. My son says he has 0, 0, 0 and all his stats. That's a weird thing that happens with Ruler Builder, I guess. Once I start time, he'll have stats. But we're going to take this person with the highest stewardship. The alternative is way worse at Intrigue. And that seems like the important stat to have. So sure. Send that proposal for him. My third son's intelligent, my fourth son is fecund and handsome, my fifth son is nothing. Going to marry someone with relatively high learning and espionage for my other sons, I think? That way I can use them as spy masters and priests. That seems pretty sensible. This is the genius fecund son. Do I have two of those? I forgot who I've been marrying so far, so it's easy to solve this. I'm just going to wait for the current marriages to go through, and I know I haven't married my last son who has no traits, so I can arrange a marriage for them too. Find somebody with good 
Okay, don't find anyone with good learning. Let's sort by something else then. I guess you'll take this person. Oh, hey, you're Midas Touch, despite your rough stewardship. That's perfect. I need one of those to teach my children. All right, I've double checked myself. I figured it out. This is the guy that still needs a marriage partner. And there's really no one great for him, unfortunately. I'm just gonna get somebody else who's half decent at stewardship in case he somehow ends up in charge of everything. Wait, uh, wouldn't gray eminence give them more fertility? Am I remembering that right? No, maybe that's in the other game, but it's not in this one. Congratulations, Gunhilder, go get married. And on the off chance that I don't die, I should tell my people to do things. I want to organize the army. I want to, uh, I guess, support schemes. Not that I'm going to have any on this character. Collect taxes, monthly prestige, and a monthly piety. But I'm probably just going to drop dead immediately, right? Let's see how it goes. All right, we formed an alliance with this guy by accident. Where are you? This is very important. Where is this place? Try not to get killed by the Scots. I didn't know I was forming an alliance with you. All right, two marriage proposals went through. That one went through. I'm not married, but that's fine. Actually, just because just it's funny. Oh, apparently I died. I was trying to... I thought I paused the game. I was trying to marry Jarl Bjorn Ironside's mom before I died, but I guess not. This is fine. This was the plan to begin with. Chieftain Gene Seed of Sogan has crossed the door to the World of the Spirits at 41 years of age. He died from smallpox, amongst other things. A known murderer, he will atone for his unspeakable crimes in the next life. Huh. All right, we're going to be playing as... Okay, that's rough. I don't even have a guess what my name is. I might have to change this. I like that my last name is Gene Seedson. Checks out. I understand why, but it's very funny. All right, we are paused. Let's take a look at our fan words and see how competent we actually are. I've got pretty good stats here on account of being intelligent and hail. Good stewardship. My brother is great at Marshall. He is a genius. Checks out. Pretty much they're all good at everything. And they have genius and intelligence. This guy's pretty below average, but he has good stewardship. Great learning here. I should check if any of them have gotten... Nah, they're all tier 1 to tier 3. No one has a tier 4 education. Okay, now that I am the leader, I can take concubines. I guess I only have two options here, so congratulations. You two are now my concubines. My court has run out of women to claim. And now coming over to the council, I'm going to actually, like, figure out who's in what position. I should have done this as the previous man. That way, any ill will about it wouldn't fall on my current ruler. So this guy is easily the best at the job, but he's also 51. Is Alpha one of my brothers or just, like, a dude? He's just a dude, but he's good at the job. So congratulations. That's fine. You can be pissed. This guy has a 12 in that stats. Let's go Marshall first. He's the most important job. My player, heir, and half-brother. Oh yeah, they're all half-brothers. None of them are full brothers. I don't know why they come out to be half-brothers, but I'm fine with it. I guess because none of them have moms, and that counts as all having different moms? I'm not sure. But yeah, we're going to set our half-brother here to be our marshal. It's fine. Everyone can be pissed. It doesn't much matter. I can set my half-brother as my spy master. I don't know if I really fully trust that. I'm going to go ahead and use my sister-in-law instead. Here, I can have my half-brother and champion be my steward. And no one else is close to as good as he is, so we'll take him. This is just getting real nepotistic real fast, huh? There's also a slight problem, I'm pretty sure several of these people are also going to be champions. So, let's go through all this and figure out what we need to be doing. Coming back over to me, I have actually pretty solid stats. I need to pick a lifestyle. I also need to pick a patron god. I'm going to look up the domain size formula. Right now, my realm size is one of four. Checking it out, I'm a count for two and a stewardship for two. If I had my wife help with stewardship, would that get me more domain size? It does. It gets me to one of five. Going to look up the exact formula, though. Okay, so it looks like it's five points of stewardship per domain size, so another three points from going into the stewardship lifestyle would actually get me one more domain size. 
And I am planning on personally governing, like, literally everything, so that's actually quite valuable to me. So we will be going into stewardship, specifically the one that gives plus three stewardship from domain focus. And we'll worry about what we're getting later. Oh, do I have anything I started with? I should check that out. Nope, I started with absolutely nothing, fair enough. I have something in my inventory? I have a court artifact. I have the branch of the sacred tree at the Temple of Uppsala. And apparently it's just a part of my chiefdom. Since I'm not a king, I don't actually have a court to put court artifacts into, but cool, we have this now. I can declare wars, but I can't win them. I need a court position. We should check out all of these roles, actually. Something that I quite dislike is there's something called aptitude. It's not just a skill. It's often a combination of skills with certain traits giving massive bonuses. There's like no way without checking the wiki room to know what I should pick. Just pick the person at the top because it told you to, is essentially how it goes. I'm going to go with the much younger guy because he'll be around for much longer. Sure, you can be my antiquarian, why not? The court tutor. Doesn't seem like my court tutor is going to be great. I'll go ahead and make him my half-brother just so he likes me. And a Seneschal, which is going to help me with control growth, which will matter a lot once I start conquering. My sister-in-law, why not? This is feeling like a very nepotistic government, but like the entire population of this tribe is just my immediate family and their wives. And for a bodyguard, it makes sense to pick somebody who's a champion. I feel like it should show their prowess here since I'm sure it's contributing, but whatever, we're picking him. We can get more bodyguards and we can get a personal champion. Both of those seem wholly unnecessary. And the rest of this is locked to me for one reason or another, so no reason to keep looking at it. Can I get rid of champions? I'm going to set the best six guys to be forced champions all the time because I know how valuable champions are in a fight and the last of them straight up forbidden. Because I'm only ever gonna have one army raised at a time, there's no reason to risk them. So how many of my half-brothers are in here? One, two, only two of them actually, that kind of surprises me. Also, there appear to be multiple Yingvars. Not gonna be confusing at all, guys. Now, because I need my Gyodi to like me, and he's my court physician, I feel like it's probably worth it to set up a scheme to befriend him, just to make sure nothing bad ever happens between us. Only a 74%, huh? I am not very good at scheming, it seems. Swaying is a 95, though, so I'll take that. All right, so I think until my levies are refilled, I want to be organizing the army. Once my levies are at full, I want to switch over to training commanders, but I'm pretty sure that if I ever have full levies, I'm dialing someone immediately, so it's just going to be training the army forever. And checking out my neighbors, this guy has 454 guys with four champions. This man's at 499 with four... 539 with four, so four champions looks to be the standard. 726 with four, that's way out of my league. But over here in our land, we're sitting at 486 with six. We can probably take our immediate neighbor in a fight right away. We have a few more men and two more champions. I think it's sensible to instantly dial this guy. I think we can just take him. Champions tend to be disproportionately more valuable than everything else is something I've realized. The first fight I lost when I was testing the game was just like outnumbering somebody 600 to 400 and then getting crushed because I had two champions that are four and their champions said like a third of their kills. So on that basis, I believe that I can conquer this guy. And my Kaz's belly for conquering you is um, I'm a Viking. What do you want from me? That's pretty much the whole reason. I'll become a sinner if I do this without having any faith, though. Can I make some decisions to get some faith? I can go on a pilgrimage. I can determine my personal deity. That sounds like a thing I should just be doing anyway. Devotee of Thor gets me plus two stewardship, which doesn't actually get me over the threshold. I'm at exactly 20 already. So I think I just want to take Devotee of Ulr. No reason not to, really. And I think I just want to go on a pilgrimage because I don't have enough piety to declare these wars. Even though it's only 25 piety each, this character has a whole two piety. The minimum cost of a pilgrimage is 50 gold, which I don't have either. So there's actually no way I can do anything right now unless I'm willing to become a sinner, which, you know, seems like the wrong call. I could instead just wait 10 months and I'll have the piety. Now, even though I can't go to war with this guy without penalty, I absolutely can attack him. I just need to raise them all as raiders instead, and then I'll attack him with the raiders. Which is completely different in the eyes of God. Wait, someone else is already here raiding him? Is that what's happening? That's not cool, man. I guess I'll, I guess I'll lower my armies. 
Who are you? Why are you still on my prey like this? Gonna disband my armies, I guess, because, like, if I keep wandering into other territories, I'm gonna hit somebody who's got more army, like that guy down the road had more army. This guy, I think, also has more army, enough that it could just be a nightmare where I'd never win the war. So yeah, I guess I'm just gonna sit on my thumbs awkwardly. It's only a few months until I can actually declare a war without tremendous immediate blowback, but I'm still not happy about it. Oh, if you're fighting him, you're actually gonna make yourself vulnerable to war. Yes, you called him. Perfect. Terrible decision. I don't know why you did that. Wait, is he almost winning? That's very impressive. Still lost them. That's a few hundred soldiers I don't need to worry about anymore. And I'm very close, just two more months now until I can... No, it might be three more months. Ah, uh, it's three more months. What's happened? I have an unpressed claim. I don't need claims, it's fine. If I were playing a different faction, that would be really important. But unfortunately, I gained 150 prestige for my steward doing a great job. I don't know, for my spouse doing a great job. Well, that fix is like the only problem I had. Thank you. I don't have the maximum number of champions? Are you Are you sure about that? Oh, you are. You are. How much money do you want? Three dollars? Congratulations. Wait. I totally did, though. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so all that's fine. It wasn't any of my champion brothers that died. That's all that really matters. And we just need to wait until that number ticks over to 25 and we can finally go to war. There we go. Hey, you remember when you tried to stop those guys who had already beaten you? So, yeah, he just looks incredibly dead, doesn't he? That doesn't even look close. And a neat thing that you can do in CK3 is you can use rally points really abusively. So I've got this rally point down here now, and I'm gonna raise all of my armies here instead. And then we're gonna go kill this man. So, um, this is not looking close. I've got more champions and more men. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. And because sieges just take a while, we're gonna go up to five times speed. Generally speaking, I'm probably going five times speed more often than not. Okay, pause it there. Oh, wait. All right, that's good news, but... Get on to four, and let it take over to its final. Or not. All right, so I'm trying to get this Bursky fellow to stay at my court. He's an adventurer. He's got 17 prowess and good stats. That sounds good. I don't want to take those odds. That's just bad. And I don't need the... Yeah, I'd just rather this guy join my court. He's very good. Why is everyone having such problems? We still haven't finished the siege. So I just lose 100 piety and I have no alternative. Spymaster, please. Why are you doing this to me? Okay. Alright, we've won the fight at least. <sighs> if she'd waited literally a day, I could have won this fight, taken my soldiers down, and declared another war. But now I have to wait like an actual couple of years to go to war because of that event. Regardless, enforce demands. Enforce demands. Lower my army. And let's go check out our champions. There might be a better guy available now. You're here. How much money do you want? Ten bucks? That's that's a bit on the steep end. I'm sorry. I think I'm going to take my half-brothers off the field when given the option. Just because they're obviously more valuable to me, I don't want them fighting. Yeah, 754 guys. We could go for a raid at this point. And that seems like the only real sensible thing to do. So I'm going to raid all my raiders down here. I need to remember to toggle them over since I didn't raise them as raiders because I'm using a rally point. But also, did I capture some people? Are there people in my jail? Are any of you worth anything to me? You'll like me more. None of you have money? They both have bad personal combat, but that guy does have 15 martial. I think I'm just going to save those two guys for a blot. And even at 15 martial, he's not the best one I've got available. Seems a little bit scandalous to sacrifice a holy warrior on a blot, but here we are. So, these guys gather up, toggle them over to raiding. This place was just put to the torch, apparently. It looks like there's 12 raid loot here. The issue is I don't want to fight their army of 500 over and over again. 
I have 200 more than them. Surely they're not going to try to fight me, right? I've given birth to a daughter. And I think if she had traits, it would tell me. That is not the case. She is Cumlin. Sure, Goloth, why not? I'm not attached to your name because I don't love you. You don't have enough traits to be loved. Like, surely they're not going to try to fight me with 500 men over and over and over again, right? That would just be ridiculous. Alright, good. I was very worried they would immediately raise and try to fight me despite, like, guaranteeing a loss. I don't really trust the AI when it comes to how they're going to behave. That puts us at 15 of 74. We'd obviously like to get quite a lot more than that. Since he's currently raiding people, it implies that his navy is already raised. So I think I can come down here and attack this tribe for 15 gold. Because he's raiding multiple people right now, which means his armies are away. Oh, so that sea takes ages to get across. Oh, it's just getting on the sea that takes ages. Oh, that's not good. Wait, you're not here. You're somebody else. Thank God. What's in a name? Did I... Wait. Didn't we already name you? I'm so confused. I have two daughters? Who was the previous character? Was it someone else's daughter? Yes, it was. I thought that was my daughter. Absolutely. Name her whatever you want. Anyway, what were we doing? We were raiding... All right, there we go. We have their money. We'll pop over to the next towns. It's a little bit greedy to keep going for this because they will eventually come back. I'll stop after this one. All right, we have tooltip modes. I know about that. Education, know about that. County control, know about that. Victory. I can declare wars, low county control. Oh, thank you for reminding me. I just didn't even think about it. Yeah, my marshal should absolutely be handling county control right now. So we're going to have him govern this place. Without county control, these people are giving us almost no levies, almost no taxes. We need to get that control established. Oh, shit. Well, my greed has been my undoing. Oh, wait, we won. You absolute legends. Please get out now. Wait, was this place actually robbed? It was. The Mad Lads. And like I said, champion count really matters. What was I doing at first when it was gold? Because apparently I wasn't moving. I don't really understand what just displayed there, because for a while it looked like we were barely making any progress, and then it switched over, but we hadn't moved. Regardless, let's get this money home. We lost a few hundred soldiers, but we get 40 gold and 40 prestige. Definitely worthwhile on the whole. All right, now that they're back, we can lower our armies. My marshal earned respect, and that means that everyone loves him. Who cares? My court physician is better at his job. That's great. I failed my sway attempt on the priest. I delivered the loot back. That was a very impressive fight, guys. I want to see the details of this. Is it just champions hard carrying? You bet it is. It's just champions hard carrying. The Rangian veterans also probably did more than their fair share of work, right? It sure as hell wasn't the levies. We know that much. Levies seem like they might be the least important part of my army in this game, which is very weird coming from CK2. And pursuit phase, we killed like literally nobody. But yeah, glad we won that fight and we can raise a runestone with all that money, getting us the piety we need to get out of this hellscape that we find ourselves in. And that would in turn let us go to war. So yes, let's raise a runestone. Okay, so I had to take a quick look at what the runestones do again when I actually did this. What we want to do is we want to build the control runestone for the guy we conquered, and we want to build it in the place we conquered to remind them of their defeat to build control there. Which is kind of metal, I'm, I'm a fan of that. And now that we've done that, we have a lot of piety again, and we can look at our neighbors and try to... First, we have 558 soldiers, we can't take that guy. What about this guy? 485? Absolutely, we can take him. Hey dude, check this out. I want your land, and that's Cassius Valley, where we come from. Now, going back to this rally point, we raise everyone here. And then, I should have made a new commander, or a new champion, rather, but it's fine. They'll still crush. I still have more champions and more and better men-at-arms, so they're just going to get absolutely obliterated. And one of our people have had a kid. How are you doing? 
All right, so the kid's great. He's a comely genius, but more importantly, the family crest on this specific background makes it look like it's just painted onto metal. It doesn't look like it's on a black background or flag at all, which I quite like. Anyway, Einar is a great name. Go ahead. And we're going to switch this up to five times speed because we just need to wait for this to finish. And apparently I found a whale. What do we do with whales? Do we kill them? I don't want to spend prestige, but I do want to gain money. Am I currently stressed? That's very important. I'm a little bit stressed, not too much. I can make 50 gold at the cost of 20 stress. That's not terrible. Wait. <laughs> Does every single option give me stress? Only taking the chance of losing 75 prestige gives me... Yeah, Chris. I think I let it go free for their guaranteed prestige. And I'll just need to go on a hunt or something at some point. Yeah, yeah, keep running back and forth into me to waste my time and slow down the siege. It's very funny. Anyway, what are we talking to about? We're talking to my brother about... So he tells me about how cool he is. And I can either befriend him and lose some stress, or 50% chance of both of me getting better at something relating to what he's talking about. I'd like to be friends with my family and be less stressed. I don't really see much value in taking that small chance for a small increase. Alright, cool. War's over. Enforce demands. Give me your land. And I believe we still have plenty of domain size. Three of six. Oh, apparently we took him hostage. Can you afford to free yourself by any chance? Oh, we let him go when we won. That's a damn shame. I have a lot of prisoners. Can any of you afford to free yourselves? None of them have any money. It's time for a blot. So what does it cost to run a grand blot? 200 prestige. Yeah, that seems perfectly reasonable and death rebirth. Although smaller blot are held for many occasions throughout the year, once a decade, the Asatruan... Dude, I gotta look up how to spell my religion. I'm so used to calling them Norse pagans, and I can't pronounce this. All right, this is what I'm being told by the internet. Oh, show true is what I'm hearing. You know what? We're going to go ahead and call them Norse pagans, because that does not feel like a thing I can consistently say normally. Once a decade, the Norse get together for a grand celebration and a grand sacrifice. I need to figure out if I'm spending 50 gold, 75 gold, or I decide that I don't have this kind of money. Well, I guess I'm going to wait till I raid a little bit more so I can do the proper big blunt. I've got an available perk. I can demand payment for hooks. That's what I think I want. What are the other options? I can demand payment for hooks, collect taxes better, build faster, or claim throat against my leash. I think what I might be able to do, let me see if this works. So like, you're free now because I won the war and released you like a chump. But going over to prisoners, if I go to this guy and I'm like, hey, do you want to release yourself? Let's negotiate a release. I want a weak hook on you. Get out of here. And then we let time pass so he can accept it. And of course he accepts because he doesn't want to be in jail. And I come over to him and say, hey, unfortunately, he doesn't have enough payment to actually do anything with this. However, I can still release them all and see if I can demand payment for their hooks in the future. How long does a weak hook exist? It looks like it lasts essentially forever. Good. So since I can't sacrifice anyone yet and there's always more time in the future, I'm just gonna ransom all of these dudes out for weak hooks. And in the future, if they happen to have money, I'll remind them that they owe me. And that seems reasonable enough to me. Also, I'm gonna go ahead and take my marshal and have them build control down here because there's a runestone up in the other one. Everyone accepted their ransoms. There's probably a button to clear all of this, huh? Oh no! Apparently my wife and son died. Well, we'll have to get another one. On the good news, my priest likes me. So let's go find a spouse. Oh, wait a second. This person has Amazonian. Is there any chance of you accepting? They will. I mean, you're the wrong culture and the wrong religion, but... You also have Amazonian. I can also get Signy, who's the right religion and has 20 espionage. 
which seems like it might be more relevant. Like, Robust is still pretty good. All right, it's fine. We got a better wife at the end. It all worked out for the best. Now, I can hold a Grand Blunt, but not really. I'm too poor. I don't want to go on a Varangian Adventure, as cool as they are. Wait, do I want to go on a Varangian Adventure? I'll think on that one. We've won 19 battles since the last time I clicked any of this stuff. Apparently, I've just been letting my army stand around this whole time. Shouldn't I be doing that? I can probably crush the guy north of me just instantly if I wanted to. I have way I have seven champions to his presumed four, right? So even though we have the same number of military. Yeah, he's at 714 with four champions and 400 men at arms. I'm at 736 with seven champions and 400 men at arms. My Varangian veterans are a much higher quality troop than what does he have? Vigmen. Which are not exactly very valuable to him because they just counter skirmishers, and I have none of those. I do think it would be an appropriate use of my time here to remember that I can just improve my Varangian Raiders and just do that twice. It seems very good. And yeah, if we're doing that, we need to get more prestige, which means we need to go to war with this man and take all of his land. And that means we're raising this army again. Raise everyone here, please. 803. Thanks for marrying me. What were your stats again? More importantly, what can you do for me? Oh, you're terrible at domain, though. Yeah, that's a slight issue. You can help with intrigue, though. If I want to scheme, you're great at that. Going back to me, though, I'm too short of the next threshold for more domain. I can change my personal deity over to Thor, though, and that will get me there. And I don't need to do that just yet, because I'm still not at my domain limit. But yeah, there's no issue whatsoever. We can just go. So let's go conquer this guy. Oh, his men, his men was off raiding. They just got back. And they got absolutely obliterated, and he was leading the army, so we won instantly. <laughs> Let me see the battle details for that. Champions 108 kills, ranging veteran 75, rest of the army combined 59. Oof. Yeah, it's just champions of ranging veterans wrecking shit, man. That's why we beat the um, Danish a while back. Although they don't call themselves the Danish yet. Wonderful job. And let's go ahead and just end the war instantly, because that idiot is not as good at leading his men as he thought he was. We're going to tear down this rally point now. And we're going to make yet another new rally point at the very top of our empire. So right there. And we immediately get rid of these guys. No reason to keep you standing. Actually, is there stuff to raid around here? If I were to toggle raiding. I might have to fight this guy's whole army, but his whole army is not actually that tough. So I could walk through his land. I'd get here in 53 days and then down here. Oh, it would take forever. Let's not. Is there any coastal stuff up here? It looks like other people have already had the same idea, so no. I'm confident in my troops, but not so confident that I think I can go to mainland Europe. So you might be wondering why am I not just raiding Europe? That's actually a super fair question. I haven't addressed that yet. So before I end the video, I'm going to talk about why I've been doing it the way I've been doing it in terms of raiding. And these guys are definitely not going to continue raiding, they're just going to disband. And we're going to be resummoning them, just teleport them across the map down here. And next time we're going to go raid somebody, probably like Wales and Ireland. But the reason I'm not going over to England or France or even the Netherlands, these very rich places, is because in CK2 you could see far enough away, because you were seeing in terms of counties. You could be like, oh hey, this is two counties away, I can see them, time to go, and you could get out before they got to you. But now Fog of War isn't determined by these county lines, which by the way are from the map mod I'm using. It's not in the base game to have clear county lines. I absolutely love that I can see the county borders now. You're seeing now instead of county lines, barony lines, and you're still seeing two away. So the distance you see in Fog of War is tremendously lower. And as a result, when you see somebody, if you try to get in your boats immediately, my experience has been that every single time they catch you every single time they get to me before I get in the boats. So if I go to these places where if I were to click on Othringa, you can see there's a duke in charge of the whole coast. Dukes in charge of the coast. These guys have their military bases fairly close to where I'm going. The one exception being that Holland is based over here and can't protect this specific town very well. But yeah, raiding people who are competent 
is very difficult now compared to like back in CK2. You could just be like, I know I'm one tenth your size, but I'm still going to take all your money. Because the second thing that's a problem is that when you raid, I've already shown this off, you don't just steadily get money until they're out. You build up threshold until you break down their walls, you win a siege, and then you take everything. It's all or nothing. So I can't just think I'm running out of time and leave with some of the money. I have to complete the siege, and I just can't safely do that against competent enemies. Although I'm getting to the point fairly quickly where my army might actually be able to take on real European powers. Do I have children in need of educating? No, my oldest kid is like one, so our oldest kid period is like two or three. So between episodes, I'm gonna decide if I want to go on a Varangian adventure and abandon everything I built here to carve out a new home for myself, or if I wanna go raiding against probably Ireland and Wales, the people who actually can't stop me. However, that's it for now. I've been rather coherent. I hope you're enjoying Crusader Kings 3. I've been really liking my time in it so far. And if you did, then like, comment, subscribe. All that YouTube algorithm nonsense really does help the channel grow and is greatly appreciated. If you have too much disposable income, you can support me on Patreon. And either way, I'll see you in the next one.